Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. Christians who take the Bible as the literal word of God believe that all of mankind is descended from one man and one woman. In the Bible story, they were created by God and named Adam and Eve. Many Christians insist they lived in the Middle East some 6,000 years ago. But many scientists believe the first humans evolved roughly 7 million years ago. For that reason, many scientists say a literal reading of the scriptures is incompatible with scientific truth. Dr. S. Joshua Swamidas doesn't buy it. He's an associate professor of laboratory and genomic medicine at Washington University. And in his new book, he uses genealogy and some really complicated math to show that mankind could well all share a common ancestor from the Middle East as recently as 6,000 years ago. The catch? He hypothesizes that that couple then intermarried with a larger population that existed outside the garden and derived perhaps from an evolutionary process. It's a provocative thesis, but he's actually finding support from some other scientists. We spoke Friday with Nathan Lentz. He's a prominent biologist who identifies as a secular scientist, not antagonistic towards religion, but not a believer. Yet he applauds Swamidas' book. Here's why. The idea that um, Adam and Eve could have been a special creation that then sort of bred into the regular human population that descended by evolution. That's that's an older idea. It's been around for a while. But what uh, what Josh has done, or I should say, what Dr. Swamidat has done, is to provide some modern science, some modern population genetics, and the science of of genealogy and ancestry into that question. And to my knowledge, no one's really done that before. No one's really. Um, brought in uh, modern science into the question of if Adam and Eve are technically possible under this model. And the reason why that's interesting to me is because much of the science that that, uh, he's talking about in this book is brand new in a sense. Uh, A lot of it really less than 10 years old in terms of our understanding of population genetics and ancestry. And a lot of us that work in the field have been really surprised at some of the results that are coming out of the field. And so it's sort of merging very modern recent science of ancestry with these older ideas about um, about Adam and Eve and Genesis and so forth. So I always like when we blend the old with the new towards establishing you know new understandings. That's Nathan Lentz of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. And joining us today to talk about his findings is Dr. Joshua Swamidas. His new book is The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal Ancestry. Dr. Swamidas, welcome to the program. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, you write in your book that your quest began with what you call a curious fact. You write, everyone was convinced that evolutionary science unsettled our understanding of Adam and Eve, but I couldn't find the evidence that demonstrated this as true. I feel like a lot of people start with the idea that we can't prove that Adam and Eve existed. Is it fair to say that your book's major achievement is that you've shown we can't prove that they didn't? I'd say that's what it is. If you go back uh, almost exactly 160 years ago, that's when Darwin publishes Origin and the Species. Now, he doesn't talk about human evolution because he knew that was the third rail. But his friend, Huxley, went straight there. He went where Darwin feared to tread. And that's when the debate began. That, you see that debate trace through things like the Scopes trial, and it ends up being the fundamental reason why there is so much conflict about evolution in society. It's about human evolution, whether or not we really share common ancestors with the great apes. But the beauty of it is it turns out that even though everyone has been so certain that that's in conflict with Genesis, it just turns out that that's not true. Um, Both things could be happening at the same time. Now, your thesis rests on this idea of two groups of humans, that Adam and Eve were created by God and are the mother and father of creation. But you posit in your book that they intermarried with a second population. What do you think about the second population? Are, are they humans? Are they apes? Or maybe some hybrid? Well, if, if Adam and Eve were recent, we know they were homo sapiens. They had minds. They, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them and us. Uh, the only difference would be that they don't descend from Adam and Eve. So there's like some interesting questions for theology, how to make sense of that. But I want to be careful about saying that I proposed it. It turns out that this is an idea that's been around for a very, very long time. This is actually even a traditional Uh, It's within the traditional range of views of Genesis. So uh, if you go back, there's been open speculation for a very long time about what we can call the mystery outside the garden. Like, what's going on out there? We don't know. You're (laughs) suggesting there's even some clues in Scripture. Um, For example, that Cain finds a partner 
um, outside the garden. So people have always wondered, well, how could he have found somebody if Adam and Eve are the only people that exist? You feel like that solves both your problem here of genealogy and also solves this mystery in the scriptures. Yeah, and, and once again, I'm not the first person to wonder about that. I mean, I, I think one of the bigger uh, the bigger clues actually is Genesis 2, where there's so much focus, about a third of the chapter is focused on delimiting the borders of the garden. <laughs> and then the story kind of proceeds within the garden. And then the way how Adam and Eve lose their immortality is by being cast away from the garden, which just immediately raises questions about, well, what's outside there? <laughs> mm-hmm. And you really have to ignore these parts of the text not to be asking that question. Now, you write, there is no evidence for or against Adam and Eve, ancestors of us all. Adam and Eve fall in a gaping blind spot hidden from our view. Key to your argument when you're talking about this is that genetics is not genealogy. For those of us who don't have a background in either, help us understand the difference and why is this so important to your thesis? Yeah, this is one of the reasons why uh, it's really worth reading, even if you think that Adam and Eve is a myth. And even if you think evolution's a myth, either way, there's just really interesting science here about ancestry. We think that um, ancestry, genetic ancestry, is genealogical ancestry, but it's not. Genetic ancestry is how DNA passes to us. Uh, and that's a very modern understanding. We didn't even know what DNA was until like, the last 60 years or so. And Genealogical ancestry is different. It's a very ancient understanding that we all have, too, which is the idea of offspring and parents and, and, and so on and so forth. These family trees. Exactly. Pedigrees or family trees. So one way to think about it is, or to think about the difference, is thinking about just in, in, your, in your family. Like you have parents. You, you have a mother and father, I imagine. <laughs> this is true in my case, yes. <laughs> I think it's true in most of our cases. Well, they're both 100% your genealogical ancestors, Sarah, right? Mm -hmm. But they're only 50% your genetic ancestors. And it turns out that your grandparents are 100% your genealogical ancestors, but they're only 25% your genetic ancestors. You go back farther, it's 1 8th, 1 16th, 1 32nd. And it turns out in just a few hundred years, in about 15 generations or so, the majority of your genealogical ancestors don't give you any DNA. Mm -hmm. They end up being just genetic ghosts that are really 100% your genetic ancestors. I'm sorry, your genealogical ancestors, <laughs> but they're not your genetic ancestors. So and that even gap with is these, important. Even yeah. with these fancy like 23andMe tests where they're swabbing the inside of my cheek, they're not going to find my great-great-grandfather past a certain point. Exactly. And I'd, I'd say uh, most of us in science would characterize those ancestry tests as on par with a horoscope. <laughs> really? Yeah, the thing about it is if you just go back a few thousand years, we all share the same ancestors. We're all, we're all the same family. It doesn't matter what race you are, what ethnicity, what gender. It doesn't matter any of those things. We're all the same family. We're just much more connected than we ever imagined. So if they're trying to tell me I'm 23% of this race or I'm 40% from Eastern Europe, you're saying we don't know what those populations were doing uh, a thousand years before that. What, it, what they're talking about is just genetics. They're talking about merely about the genetics and where you get it from. And it's not even about where, what, who those people were in the past, but just about the populations that are currently here, which we know now aren't even the ones that were there in the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it ends up being really not a really, it's not a correct view of our histories. And I think this is important because I think sometimes we take pride in our ancestry which is not necessarily a bad thing, but often that's saying, you know, well, I have an ancestry and other people don't. But the reality is we all share the same ancestors. We're all the same race. We're all the same blood, the human race. And so instead of looking at these little clues that we can get from, say, swabbing the inside of someone's cheek, you're doing some elaborate modeling based on genealogy. If this uh, population was followed by this, was followed by that. Well, I would say it's not so elaborate what I'm doing. It's actually very well-established science. There's a really important paper that came out in 2004 in Nature um, where there was elaborate modeling done. And um, what I've really done is taken that and really tried to make sense of that to answer this more focused question. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to, to just be a consequence of just how genealogy works different than, than genetics. Like genetics kind of dissipates into an ocean like a drop of water. <laughs> But uh, genealogy is a lot more like, uh, you know, a dynamite, a stick of dynamite exploding in a chain reaction. <laughs> because, so that's the difference. And when you know that uh, and you realize that genetic, a genealogical ancestry converges just a few thousand years in the past, mm -hmm. that, that really changes things. And uh, I, th I think one particular place where I think we really need to think about this and talk about it more as a society is how this impacts our understanding of race. 
we tend to think about uh, those other populations that have been isolated for a long time. They're not our family is what we think. We think that they have their concerns. And maybe we care about them when we do outreach or whatever. But the reality is that if you really look at this from a scientific point of view, that's just, not, that's just an illusion. They're our family too. Nathan Lentz, the biologist at John Jay uh, College of Criminal Justice in New York City, he says there's something marvelous in your findings that shouldn't get lost in any controversy. What I think is, I hope doesn't get overlooked about this book, uh, because it has other imp social implications as well, is this idea of what we call universal ancestors. So universal ancestors are these individuals, real, real living people, who backwards in time actually end up being the ancestors of the entire human race. And the idea was that to go back to find someone who's, who really is in all of our genealogies, the, the original idea was you'd have to go back about 200 to 300,000 years, um, you know, pre-language. We're talking about, um, you know, the earliest human populations in sub-Saharan Africa. But what we found, and this is the recent science, is that you don't have to go back that far at all. Actually, within the last five or 6,000 years, there were probably universal ancestors, real individuals, either in North Africa or the Middle East, who ended up through pure chance as ancestors of every single person uh, alive today. And that's a really remarkable amount of interrelatedness that we all have. I don't care if you're from, um, you know, a, a remote island in Indonesia, you are closely related to someone in South Asia or Europe or whatever. You are much more closely related to those people than you think. And that's Nathan Lenz talking about just that connectedness. Um, this is something that could change um, our politics in addition to changing our understanding of biology. I think if we take it seriously, it really should. I mean, I think especially when you think about St. Louis with our divides mm -hmm. and how we try to divide families but, um, or separate our families from one another. But the reality is that we are the same family. So we're really separating people who are the same. We're talking to Dr. Joshua Swamidas of Washington University about his book, The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal Ancestry. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back shortly to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com. And now back to our conversation. We're talking to Dr. Joshua Swamidas. He's the author of The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal Ancestry. Do you have a question for Dr. Swamidas? Do you see room for both science and faith in the origin of human life? Give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. Dr. Swamidas, right before the break, we were talking about um, the idea of this universal ancestry. What do you see as the significance of that? Yeah, so it turns out that we have common ancestors. All humans across the globe have common ancestors very recently in the past. And that means that if Adam and Eve really existed, if they're real people in a real past, that we all descend from them. That means that we're all the same family, the same race, the human race. And it turns out that this has been the center of the conflict between uh, the Christian faith and evolutionary science for 160 years. And it turns out that that conflict might actually be resolved with a resolution where we have the science to show that those theological conclusions all along were not nearly as, um, as off base as we thought. <laughs> yeah. So that rather than us deriving from various um, apes or other primates. Well, that happened that, too, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you're arguing here that we do have this one man and this one woman, and this we could all have traces of them within us. Well, the, the, the key point is this. It's not about that we have traces. The issue is that science has a checkered relationship with racism too. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that happened is people started thinking about evolution among humans. They started to think that there was distinct biological races, some of which were more intelligent than others and had different rights and responsibilities and all of that. And a lot of theologians, a lot of Christians, I mean, Christians have, you know, their own issues with racism at times. But this is one of these issues where they, where they were really horrified by the idea of denying the unity of all mankind. And the real core issue of the Catholic Church and other places 
has been, well, you know, that's not true because we all descend from Adam and Eve. And the response to them has been, you know, you need to get with the program and accept that we know scientifically it's obvious that X people over here are not as smart as Europeans. It's obvious that, and you can go in and fill the blank. Mm -hmm. And so turn- they were using science to sort of prop up some terrible ideas. But you're saying maybe the science wasn't even correct. Well, now we know, actually. So over the last 50 years, um, there's been a major shift. And the big idea um, that people had is that maybe evolution explains all the differences between the races, with this idea called polygenesis. Mm-hmm. We found out in the last uh, 50 or 60 years that polygenesis is false. Mm-hmm. And it turns out to be false on several grounds, one of which is that if Adam and Eve exist... If they did, and I know there's a debate about that, that's fine. You can think Adam and Eve are a myth. But if they existed, we also descend from them. So we know that polygenesis is false. Now, you acknowledge in this book that you took some professional risk in going public with this work. Were you worried that you'd be branded as maybe a religious nut? Yeah. I uh, find myself in the no man's land between the trenches. (laughs) Then maybe religious people also aren't happy with some of your thesis? I think it's a complex thing. I think this really unsettles the conversation. There's been some pretty entrenched positions for a very long time, and this reshuffles the jack. Um, A lot of the the reviewers uh, and the the endorsers actually are from across the spectrum. Many of them are creationists. Many of them are evolutionists. Some of them are firm. I believe Adam and Eve are real. Some of them don't. It's the whole range. And this is just surprising enough an idea that I think that it might even change what the camps are. But... That that change puts you in a place where you know it's it's risky. I mean, so I uh, what I went forward with this when another scientist was, was saying things to people in the religious community that that just wasn't wasn't really true. And I kind of tell me a in. little bit more about that. What was what was going on where you felt like you had to step in? Yeah, there was a there's a pastor named Tim Keller who is a well known theologian out in New York. Uh, he's a moderate. He believes that the Earth is old. He believes there's no problem with evolution out in the animal kingdom, and he said that you know, well, there's this one thing that is important. When I read scripture, it really seems like it that we all come from Adam and Eve, and that they were de novo created, like out of the dust and out of a rib. And there was a scientist that stood up and said, you know, that that's not true. <laughs> And you need, and you know, you're going to put, put people in a really anti-science position if you say that's a fundamental thing. Mm-hmm. And I was really disturbed by that because what he said is entirely consistent with the evidence. Now, ev- science doesn't tell us that's true, but mm-hmm. it certainly doesn't put you in an anti-science place. And so, even though I didn't have tenure at the time, <laughs> so this is what spurred you for this particular timing. Here, yeah. you don't have tenure, and you felt obligated to speak up and say, "We don't know this to be false." Then tell us what happened with that tenure process. Well, this is, this is actually where I've come to really deeply respect my colleagues in science. You know, I'm a Christian. I believe that there's some legitimacy to scripture. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That, that's who I am. And most of my colleagues are atheists. And what I was doing could easily be construed as creation science or pseudoscience. And in general, I mean, I just have to say over and over again, my colleagues, rather than just guessing where I am, they'll always come and talk to me. They'll always read hmm. what I said directly and carefully. And they... They saw what I did. They saw it was good science. And they were secular in the sense that they were fair to me. Mm -hmm. That's what I think secular means. It means fair. They were fair to me, and they gave me tenure. Now, yesterday we spoke with another Washington University-based scholar. That's emeritus biology professor Alan Templeton, who studies genetics. He wrote a foreword for your new book. He told us three main aspects of your book appealed to him. The first is that you delineate the distinction between a genetic ancestor and a genealogical ancestor, as we discussed. Um, The second is the way you build on some work he did on the interconnectedness of humans. And thirdly, he really gives you props for approaching your topic very scientifically. He actually believes your work opens new possibilities for religion and science working together. They can sometimes be synergistic. Um, you know, so much of the, the whole literature on science and religion is one of, of antagonism. And uh, I personally don't feel that way. I like say I'm a, a religious Jew, and I'm a scientist, and I don't see any conflict in that at all. And I know Joshua is a religious Christian and a scientist, and he doesn't see a conflict in that. And so this book is one example of how he can be both a scientist and a religious Christian at the same time. That's Alan Templeton, a professor emeritus at Washington University. Um, Have you been able to find common ground with people from other faiths that don't necessarily share your interpretations of the scripture? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that 
what is what I what I think is beautiful about science is that it is secular, it is fair, and there's things that we can come to and agree upon, even if we disagree on our personal beliefs, and that's really not what it's about. And what's important, I think, about this dialogue between uh, religion and faith, specifically in human origins, is that you know origins is often a big ugly fight, <laughs> and that's why we all steer clear of it. And that's a that's to a grave disservice to all of us because I tell you what, origins is a living part of our inheritance. That's continually inviting us these grand, these you know these these grand questions about what it means to be human and the human condition. We really miss out when we walk away from origins. And both science and theology is engaging those questions in depth. And for us to only pursue the science is to ignore the deep history of contemplation on it, and to just only look at the theology is to miss out on these amazing findings we're finding out about our shared history. And there's an in- opportunity not to mix the two per se, but to bring them into dialogue to really pursue these things and understand them better together. We're talking to Dr. Joshua Swamidas. He's the author of The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal Ancestry. I want to go to the phone lines here. We've got Robert calling from St. Louis. Hi, Robert. You're on St. Louis on the air. Yeah, hi. How are you? And uh, a pleasure to be on the air. Um, just to, I'll try to be as brief as I can, but I, I went to Episcopalian school in Houston, Texas for years that taught creation science. And afterwards, many of the things that I was taught were shown to me to be clear falsehoods. Uh, just one example, they pr- were purported to prove that the Earth was five to 6,000 years old based on geological record of iron filings that would line up with the magnetic uh, poles of the Earth, Mm -hmm. and that understanding the maximum magnetic potential of the Earth, that the Earth could not be anything more than 6,000 years old. But Yeah, this ends up, I kind of grew up in that world, too, and I left it. It was just a lie. Yeah. So, Robert, what did that do? Did that sort of, like, shake your openness even to the kind of arguments that Dr. Swami Das is making today, or where did that leave you? Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> it does. I mean, as soon as I hear, hear him lining up the 5,000, 6,000 year uh, number, it just makes me believe that he's just part of a disinformation campaign that, you know, I was subjected to as a child. Yeah. So and, what uh, I want to tell you about that, first of all, is I get what you're saying. I mean, I grew up in that world, too. I was raised young earth creationist and I left it primarily because I saw dishonesty there. And um, I do think that there are honest people that are doing the best they can because they've been misinformed, but I also saw straight out dishonesty. And so when I say things like this, it makes complete sense that you wonder if I'm in that community. But that's not what's going on here. For me, um, I think that we need to be honest about what science does say and what it doesn't. And this is just something that, you know, that it does that it doesn't actually tell us. It doesn't tell us about anatomy six thousand years ago. And if you, if you really doubt what I'm saying, I just encourage you to look at the endorsements of the book. There's people from across the spectrum. None of them are young Earth creationists. <laughs> Um, Robert, I want to thank you for that call. And unfortunately, we are out of time here today. But people who are interested in Dr. Joshua Swamidas' book, it is actually out on the streets as of today. It's The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal Ancestry. And I would encourage you to give it a read and and then see what you think. So Dr. Swamidas, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Um, Coming up next, Circus Harmony. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.